Hello, everyone. My name is Ralston King. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Government Affairs here at the Medical Society of Virginia. Thank you all for tuning in or listening wherever you are. Uh, I would first like to s start by saying uh, thank you to all of those who participated in a variety of different activities to help us have a successful uh, 2018 General Assembly session. There was many voter voice messages that went out a variety of different alerts and updates, folks who came to Richmond to visit with their legislator, uh, uh, PAC contributions that occurred outside of the session, uh, a variety of different uh, processes that help us uh, determine a legislative agenda, and even those who set policy at the House of Delegates. Uh, every one of you are vital to the success that the organization has uh, for government affairs and policy. Many of you probably don't know, but we follow over 350 bills that are specific to the policy compendium that you all set at the House of Delegates at the annual meeting. We have close to 100 bills that we amend or modify to make them more favorable to the physician community. And so it's a significant amount of work uh, that goes into uh, a long session for 60 days that we had this year, uh, and even during the short session where we have uh, 45 days. And so as many of you all know, the one thing that's still lingering is the budget uh, that was not agreed on. Uh, they did adjourn uh, the General Assembly session uh, at the appropriate date, which was Saturday. Uh, however, the budget is still lingering. They have till July 1st uh, to pass a budget before the government were to shut down. And so Governor Ralph Northam, a physician, has called them back uh, April 11th prior to veto session, which would take place April 18th and is in hopes that the budget conferees will have a budget uh, crafted and agreed upon and they can submit that to the governor's desk for signage. Um, there'll be a lot of action here in the next uh, month moving forward uh, to find a, an appropriate budget that all can agree upon. I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about um, uh, the financial wins and successes that we did have uh, from the General Assembly session. Uh, the first one is House Bill 139, which is a credentialing bill. And that's been something that many physicians have been interested in uh, moving forward, and that will essentially allow those who are going through the credentialing process with a health plan, can often take up to 120 days. Uh, they're unable to see patients in the HMO world. They can see Medicare, they can see Medicaid, but unfortunately they're unable to see those HMO patients on, commercial, on the commercial side. Now they're able to see those patients and they can retroactively get paid or reimbursed for the care that they provided to those patients if they end up getting credentialed, which in, in the a majority of the cases, they end up going through that credentialing process and do get approved. What a great victory for the physician community. Um, we've looked at some conservative analysis from, from, our, from a variety of different practice managers and it looks like some of them uh, say it could bring in um, in excess of $1,000 in additional revenue per day of the physicians who can now see patients and get paid uh, for that care. So excellent win by all who participated in that effort. Um, a couple other issues on tort reform. Uh, there was a significant battle that was created by the Chamber of Commerce and Virginia Trial Lawyers and with that uh, the physician community kind of fell in the middle and one of those bills was uh, loss of consortium that was carried by Senator Ben Chafin and uh, Delegate Jeff Campbell. And what that would have done is created unlimited liability for a physician if a personal injury case were to occur that, in, that um, plaintiff could have filed um, uh, unlimited liability towards uh, the brothers, sisters, children, spouse of a personal injury case um, and really would have set a physician back by having to either take out another medical malpractice coverage uh, policy or would have significantly increased their premiums. Uh, we were able to kill that bill with a variety of different messages uh, that came out through voter voice, uh, and, 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 and many alerts that came through the, uh, the MSV communications team. Uh, at one point we had over 5,000 messages that came forward. So what a great victory uh, by you all and the efforts that um, you all put forward at the session. Uh, one other issue on tort reform is punitive damages. Um, that would have um, uh, set the physician community up uh, where uh, there would have been an increase of the punitive, damage, punitive damages cap from $350,000 to $500,000. That would have raised $150,000 for the medical malpractice cap. And you might say, well, I thought we had an agreement that was based off uh, a negotiated agreement from uh, 1999 from the trial lawyers. That is correct. 
the punitive damages cap does still encompass the medical malpractice cap. So it would have raised uh, the cap another $150,000. We were able to kill that bill. Senator Chad Peterson carried that one out of Northern Virginia, and he's brought that forward the last few years. Uh, it's really important to make sure that we continue to monitor and, and participate in tort reform efforts. Some of the most critical efforts that uh, the, the lobbying team and the medical society puts forward uh, for resources and, 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 and through its advocacy work is to avert a variety of different bills that come forward that potentially could be harmful to the patients and the physicians. Uh, this year we had a significant amount of bills that we worked on, uh, one being um, a 10-day opioid limit. It would have automatically, through the statute, said a physician uh, or a prescriber cannot write over 10 days. We worked with the patron, shared what we had put forward at the Board of Medicine for regulations and guidelines. Uh, quickly that patron removed the bill and we were able to uh, uh, continue uh, talking about the good things that have gone on uh, through the Board of Medicine. and and the efforts from last year. Uh, another bill from another patron out of Roanoke, uh, uh, Delegate Sam Rasool, would have required PMP checks uh, prior to the issuance of every opioid prescription. Uh, again, we shared the, the work on uh, the seven-day PMP checks and the regulations that have been put forward last year with the help of Delegate Todd Pillion, um, and so we were able to uh, have him uh, kill that bill or put it to the side for this year. So great effort by everyone there. Um, in addition, many of you all recall the Lyme disease uh, effort uh, that came forward about five to six years ago. Uh, that, that was a strong grassroots effort by many folks in Northern Virginia who said the Lyme disease test uh, uh, that is out there uh, needs to be shared from the physician or the provider to say that the test is not accurate. Well, not every test that the physician or provider out there uh, performs is going to be 100% accurate. They wanted a notification to the patient each time a test was performed for Lyme disease. Uh, that bill would have sunsetted this year. Uh, there was a patron delegate, Kathleen Murphy, who wanted to bring that back. We were able to work with her and share that there was no evidence to prove uh, that that notification helped patients uh, or providers. If anything, it just put a burden. Uh, and, and she was able to carry that bill over uh, and, and not move forward with it this year. Uh, there was also bills out there um, from a few different folks who were looking to uh, mandate that physicians uh, use the electronic death registry system. Uh, we have uh, always advocated for physicians to be using it um, as often as they can, um, but at the same time there are some significant flaws within the system uh, that we are working with the Department of Health on, and so for mandatory usage at this time is really just premature. Uh, we were able to work with all the patrons and, and either put those bills to the side or carry them over for the year. Uh, last two bills I'll talk about deal with scope of practice. Uh, Doctor of Medical Science, I'm sure many of you all have heard about this issue, uh, came out of Lincoln Memorial University and it's a new provider license for physician assistants who graduate as a PA and then they end up going back and doing additional clinical or didactic uh, training under a, a physician um, and also do some online testing and they receive their Doctor of Medical Science uh, uh, license. Uh, unfortunately, Tennessee and Virginia had two bills uh, that would have um, uh, created this license and, and had PAs uh, potentially work through this process to become DMSs. Uh, we were able to work with the, the patron to, to, to uh, uh, kill this bill for this year, um, and so that was a successful win uh, and, and something that we've been working on for the last few years. Uh, last bill I'll talk about um, on scope is uh, the Senate Bill 511 carried by Senator Dave Suderlein. Um, that was going to drastically increase uh, the scope of practice uh, for an optometrist. It would allow them to perform surgery, uh, do a variety of different injections. Um, we were able to work with the optometrist at the last hour with the ophthalmology community and come up with a reasonable compromise uh, that does not allow them to perform surgery. Uh, the Medical Society of Virginia and many of the specialty groups uh, have a long-standing belief and policy that surgery should be performed by surgeons. And so we do not believe those who go take weekend courses uh, should be out there performing any type of surgery. Um, and so we were able to work with the optometrists and come to some sort of an agreement that really puts them um, in a place of only doing limited injections uh, to certain diseases around the eyelid. And so it really scaled back what the overall intention of the legislation uh, would have um, created. Um, and the Medical Society and the Virginia Society of Eye Physicians are very um, supportive now of, of the bill moving forward. 
I will share with the last bill, House Bill 793, the Nurse Practitioner Bill. I encourage you all to pay attention uh, here in the next week. Uh, we'll be having our President, Dr. Kurt Elward, speak uh, to the efforts on House Bill 793, review the components that are listed in the current draft, and the actions and efforts you all can take over the next week or two as we continue to move forward. So please stay tuned, and uh, thank you all for listening. Again, thanks for everyone uh, who participated in all different activities uh, surrounding advocacy uh, for the last year.